So we're here at the castle, not the castle at Warwick, we were earlier on this afternoon, the castle at Edge Hill, it's this place. Uh, it was built in 1742. I think it's probably Britain's first war memorial, that's what it is, because it was built for the, to mark the 100th year anniversary of the first battle of the English Civil War, which is the Battle of Edge Hill. And as you see, we've got this huge drop here, which is the edge of the hill. And in spring, 1642, the tensions between Charles I and Parliament reached a stage when everybody knew it was going to end up a shooting match. Uh, the King left London on March the 2nd, 1642, and headed north where most of his support was. And all through the summer, both sides began to gather their armies. And Parliament sent out uh, an edict saying all the trained bands, which are the militias, they were all now under Parliament, Parliament's control, not the King's. And the King, in turn, wrote to all the Lord Lieutenants of all the counties, so that's the sort of upper class, saying, you must rally men for me, under a, a, an order called the Array. So both sides spent the summer preparing for war, still hoping there wouldn't be a war. Uh, and Charles, in the end, went to Nottingham, raised his royal standard, declared war, and then he marched first of all to Hull, which was where most of the military supplies in Britain and England at the time were, and he tried to seize the, uh, the arsenal there. Uh, Hull rose in rebellion, wouldn't let him in. There was a siege. Uh, the king couldn't take Hull. So then he wandered all over. He went to uh, Lincoln. He went to Leicester. In each place, uh, the majority of the public were on the side of Parliament, but uh, the King just took the ammunition from the train bands and carried on. He went uh, northwest. Uh, he thought, or he knew that he had a lot more support in the west of England than in Wales, so a lot of Catholics there. And there was a religious divide to this. Uh, so he based himself near Shrewsbury, and then he decided, I've got to end this, I've got to march on London. So in October 1642, the King started the march on London. And the Earl of Essex, in charge of the Parliamentary Army, decided, well, I've got to try and stop him. This is before telephones, radios, helicopters, anything. It's all rumour. No one's the faintest idea where anybody is. Uh, and on the 22nd of October, 1642, the King and his army were literally here. Uh, and that evening, they began to get reports in of skirmishes. The village church down there, Kinnison, there were skirmishes with outliers. And both sides gradually realised that actually this isn't just a few uh, uh, patrols just out uh, on reconnaissance, the opposing armies are here. So uh, they decided, well, tomorrow we're going to have a battle. So the King and his forces were up here. He obviously hoped that the Parliament would try and attack up this. Looking out there, you've got to remember that the countryside was completely different. Almost none of those hedges were there. This was before the enclosures. It was open ground. There were a few hedges, but nothing like that. These trees weren't here. It's grazed by sheep, very, very open. And uh, so the King stationed his forces all the way along here, and by about midday on the 23rd of October 1642, he realised they weren't going to be so daft as to come up here. So he ordered his men to move down, which they did, and later in the afternoon, the battle started. So the King's forces are this side, Parliament's forces over that side. The King has his crack troops, which are cavalry, on both sides. On the right flank, which is over that side, uh, is under the command of Prince Rupert of the, Prince Rupert of the Rhine, who is one of the great cavalry commanders of the age. Uh, and immensely experienced from fighting various battles uh, in Europe. Uh, and it started with an artillery duel, nothing really happened, and then the Royalist cavalry charged. And on that wing, they swept through the parliamentary forces, took one look at them, fired their single pistol shot, and off they ran. Uh, and the Royalist forces charged after them. The Royalist cavalry on the other side saw the same thing and copied, so they did the same thing. The problem for the King was his cavalry were very enthusiastic, utter lack of discipline, so they chased the, um, the other side off. Then they thought it'd be a great idea to loot the baggage train. While they were looting the baggage train, the infantry met, and the King's infantry weren't, well, it weren't so well equipped, and they were outnumbered. The total Parliament force here was 15,000. The total of the King's forces was 12,400. Not a huge difference, but enough. So basically, by the time the Royalist cavalry started to come back, they found that the smaller parliamentary cavalry in the middle had caused immense damage to the Royalist infantry, and the battle still hung in the balance. In fact, it hung in the balance right the way through into the evening. By the time the Royal, Royalist Cavalry did began to get back and reorganise, the parliamentarians backed off, and uh, that was it for the night. It was a very cold night, clear night like today, but in October much colder. 
so much so that it had an effect on the casualty figures. Because each side lost about 500 men, dead, uh, and they had about 1,500 men injured on each side. Normally, the death ratio would have been much higher, but it was so cold that a lot of the wounded men, basically, it was so cold that the blood was congealing, uh, and they didn't lose that much blood, so a lot who would have died did actually survive. But nevertheless, the king in particular, looking the next morning, at this carnage on the battlefield, was completely shocked. And although Parliament withdrew, leaving their seven guns on the field for the royalists to take, the king was so appalled by this bloodshed that when his nephew, Prince Rupert, said, right, now march on London immediately, because they pushed the parliamentary armies out of the way, march on London now and win the war, and the king dithered and didn't march quickly enough, wouldn't let Rupert go ahead with the cavalry, with the result that when the king did get down to London several weeks later, by that stage, a new parliamentary army was massed there, uh, enough militias to stop him. It meant that a finely balanced civil war went on for years, basically. Disastrous for England. One tenth of the population were killed, one way or another, in that war. In the end of it, as you know, Oliver Cromwell won, which brings to the last bit of the story. Perhaps the reason that the uh, parliamentarians didn't win was the fact their army, although larger, was stretched out. Some six or seven thousand men didn't even get here in time for the battle. One of those men was Oliver Cromwell, uh, at the time quite a, a youngish captain in the forces of the uh, parliamentary army from the eastern region. Uh, and he said to the other officers, your men, your cavalry, are mainly old, decayed, serving men and tapsters. Whereas the Royalist cavalry are young, fit, well-equipped, and we've got to do the same. And he went back and he did reorganise things and it took some years. But in the end, of course, Cromwell and the others won for Parliament and that's the end of it. You can take a view that one side was right or one side was wrong. But I take this view that fundamentally the Royalists who died out there were fighting for tradition. The parliamentarians who died out there were fighting for democracy. Today, both of those are at threat in Britain, and so people still have to fight, but in a different way, we hope, to 1,000 men of our blood who died down there in 1642. And that's the story of the Battle of Edgehill. Thank you.